people in the room uh, from all different spheres of life and ages. Um, uh, welcome to Beta Bagels, our third one. Uh, we're really happy to have the Civic Service Design Studio from New York City Opportunity with us today to tell us all about some of their um, design practices and methodologies that they're using to make the city a better place. Um, and in particular, about how they evaluate and deliver government services in new and better ways. Um, the schedule for today is schmoozing and bageling and coffeeing, which we've done a little bit of already. Um, and now we're going to get a short welcome from Noel, um, who's from Beta NYC. I'm Kate Nicholson, uh, also from Beta NYC. And um, then we'll have a presentation from uh, Tim, Mari, and Matt from the Civic Service Design Studio. Um, so without further, and then afterwards we'll have a short Q&A. Um, you'll see some signs posted around and there's a live Q&A uh, bit.ly link here. Uh, if you have questions throughout the presentation, you can go online and submit them then and we'll just sort of take them as they go. Um, if there's not a lot there, you can also raise your hand. That's fine too. Um, and then afterwards, uh, at 10, we'll end the presentation and have more time for coffee and bagels, and then we'll close at 10.30. Um, so, Noel, hand it over to you. Great. Thank you, Kate. You're welcome. All right, give a big round of applause for Kate. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so welcome to the third Beta Bagels here at the Manhattan Borough President's Office, co-hosted with the Manhattan Borough President's Office and Beta NYC. Uh, how many of you have been to a Beta Bagels before? Raise your hand. Great. Awesome. So we got a bunch of fresh blood in here. Uh, this, this time we decided to do some experiments, so we're going we're gonna to poll the audience. Uh, how many of you work in 1 Center Street right now and discovered this event through the flyers that we put up next to the elevators? Great! Hi! <laughs> Hi, neighbors! Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, it's a real treat to have you here. Um, uh, just so you know, we're doing these events on a pretty frequent basis, so uh, thanks for coming. We hope that you can bring your friends and neighbors from other parts of the building down here to talk about uh, technology, data, and design. Uh, how many of you discovered this through our meetup and have regularly attended our other events? Okay, good number of you. Uh, and how many of you found this through other channels, whether it be design or tech meetup lists or something out of the, the non-traditional form? Oh, good, good. Our marketing team is on it, Kate. Yeah, great job. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, this time we experimented with blasting out the Slack and private email messages and Facebook groups. So glad to see a bunch of new faces in the room. Um, so, uh, just to give you a bit of context, uh, how we like to start off, uh, how Beta NYC likes to start off events here in New York City, is first recognizing the fact that all of us are, or I should say, a um, grand majority of us are immigrants and migrants to the lands and the islands that we happen to be on. Uh, there is, a, um, at the island of the center of the world, a, a book that talks about the law history of the, the Dutch settlement here speaks of the early Lenape uh, talking about the conundrum that the Europeans faced. Well, that the conundrum that they faced when the Europeans came. And they were wondering, well, nobody owns the air, nobody owns the water, so how can you own the soil? And I think this story is something that we've taken to heart uh, in our work to understand how do we ensure that the air, water, and land, and our communities are made better for the future. We really can't own them, though sometimes we like to claim that we own them. We're just blocks away from Wall Street that likes to seemingly come up with new ways to own everything. Um, but we really can't own them, and we're really just stewards for the next generation. And so within our work here in Beta NYC, we recognize the fact that we are occupiers on this soil and that we're working hard to ensure that there's a better tomorrow. So Beta Bagels itself is an experimental breakfast salon for change makers and doers. Uh, we have an interest in government, technology, data, uh, data science, and service design. Uh, this is our third one. We continue to experiment and iterate on its process. Uh, 
Kate has brought us some beautiful plastic bagels. We've now got some better, ba sourced better bagels. Uh, we've got stronger coffee, and the subject matter is gonna be better and better and better. Um, if you have ideas on subjects, topics, uh, organizations, uh, please bring them to us. We wanna be able to do this more frequently. We're very, very fortunate that the Manhattan Borough President has allowed us to come and occupy her space. Uh, Beta NYC, who's represented today by myself and Kate, uh, Emily, who's over here in the striped shirt, and Cameron, who's our, one of our summer interns. Uh, we work out of this space, and so Gail is very uh, open to bringing in other voices. If you um, don't know Gail's story, it's a miraculous story. Uh, she supported this uh, city council member who was running for speaker. His name was Bill de Blasio. He <laughs> lost that election. Chris Quinn ended up becoming speaker. And so as punishment, she was given the chair of the technology committee. Please come in, come in, have bagels. We have bagels. Okay. Um, so she, as punishment, she was given the chair of the technology committee. And as chair of the technology committee, she was like, what the hell do I do with this thing? Uh, she herself is a nerd. I call her the fairy godmother of civic tech in New York City. Um, and came to the point where I uh, was watching what was going on in DC and all of a sudden decided, let me clone what was being done around open government in the District of Columbia and the federal government. And that ended up becoming the city's open data law. Cameron, can I ask you to close those doors real quick? All right. um, um, so we ended up getting the city's open data law because Gail Brewer was punished. Uh, and uh, uh, the grand story of this is that she is one of the most entrepreneurial elected officials around technology that you will ever meet. Uh, and we have her in this office for the next uh, two years. So she has said, please use this facility as much as possible to elevate the voices of the city's technology data and design community. Um, and so while she can't join us uh, today, uh, she is here in spirit. Uh, and know that you are able to embody this, this room and to bring up those different topics uh, in the future. Uh, so what we focus on organizationally is we have four primary values, the freedom to connect, the freedom to learn, the freedom to innovate, and the freedom to collaborate. This was originated from a series of conversations that we held across the five boroughs in 2013 that is baked into our organizational plan, which is known as the, People Ro the People's Roadmap to a Digital New York City. This event itself is inspired by our friends in LA uh, who have a policy salon called Data and Donuts. Uh, thank goodness we have bagels here so we can rip off the motif. Um, and uh, these bagels have been generously sponsored uh, by Microsoft, Civic and Cities, uh, and the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. Um, and with that, we're about to kick off the event. Uh, if you want to ask questions anonymously, please use this bit.ly link um, it goes to Slido. I'll be adminning the, those questions. So if you don't feel comfortable asking those questions directly, uh, please use the Slido. Uh, otherwise, you can type in your name and you won't be anonymous. Um, uh, I will be monitoring the Beta Bagels hashtag as well as the Beta NYC. Uh, but please feel free to, to give our thanks and salutations to NYC Opportunity. Uh, they're a really great organization and we're really, really glad to have them here today. Uh, that being said, I'm now going to hand this off to the first representative from the Mayor's Office of Opportunity, uh, Matt Klein. Um, before I do that, Matt Klein was the Executive Director of Blue Ridge, and I remember uh, going in for an interview back when I was working with Code for America, and I was just, his, his office was covered in bags that, because there was like this bed bug infestation, and this guy asked me the hardest questions, and I was just like, I'm not worthy, I'm not worthy. Um, uh, Matt has, uh, for well over a decade, been focused on alleviating poverty in New York City and using technology data and design principles to get there, and is really one of the city's <coughs> most forward-thinking uh, individuals on how we build programs using technology. So it's a great honor to see him move into the Mayor's Office of Operations and to stick with the Mayor's Office of Operations through all of its upheavals to ensure that we come up with amazing programs to solve poverty in New York City. So it is a true honor to bring you up here and speak in front of this group. So everyone, Matt Klein. Uh, well, I'm just, my role is just gonna be to do a quick intro, but first I uh, wanna thank Noel, uh, thank Beta NYC, 
Um, it's uh, an honor for us to be invited to speak to this community. It's such an important part of the fabric of New York City and civic tech and engaging around important issues. And, and Noel, you've been shepherding and growing this community and um, are such an important voice in the civic landscape. So thank you for, for letting us be here. Um, just by way of brief intro, so I direct the Mayor's Office for Economic Opportunity. Uh, this is a multidisciplinary office focused on helping the city use tools of evidence and innovation to reduce poverty, uh, increase equity. So that takes on a number of different forms. Uh, we run and test pilot programs. We use rigorous evaluations to test signature initiatives like Pre-K for All and help make sure they're working and we can improve them continuously. We integrate data from across multiple agencies to try and uh, make sure the city is serving residents more holistically. Um, we develop digital products, um, work across agencies uh, with colleagues uh, throughout government. And the, when, um, uh, when we were in the early months of the de Blasio administration thinking about the vision and how we'd operationalize new elements of this office, uh, we very much thought about the role of design um, because design as a practice uh, it, it serves sort of two critical functions writ large uh, for residents. One is, um, I think for us, it helps ensure that we are engaging with residents in the process of <coughs> developing or improving programs. Too often in government, uh, we go into conference rooms and write RFPs and out they go and that's the service. Um, and they're created about ways that we hope they'll work um, and not enough with the input of residents. And then as a result of that, programs tend not to work as we imagine they would be. And so design serves the critical function of helping us see in the real world how people experience services, not how we hope they experience services. And so in many ways, the value that I, we associate with design is dignity, dignity and sort of trusting the input of residents, dignity and valuing the experiences they have. And in that way, design is not just a process, not just sticky notes and journey maps and that kind of thing, um, but it's an effort to get a better result for residents. Um, so what we'll talk about today is how we do that work in more detail. We're lucky enough to have a small but mighty uh, design team, um, and when we began to infuse our office with these principles, we knew also it was important to try and spread that practice in government, not just to focus on the portfolio projects that might originate um, out of our shop, but how we think about design practices and how those methodologies and rigor attached to those methodologies might be able to work across government in the same way that our office does. So you'll hear a little bit more about that. Um, but it's the combination of, of the dignity, but with the strict attention to rigor and outcomes that I think is the characteristic of, of our office and, and also of the Civic Service Design Studio. So again, thank you for letting us be here. And with that, I'll turn it over to my colleagues who really do the, the good work. And uh, Mari, who is our fearless leader, she is the head of the Service Design Studio, um, but and also serves as the Director of Design for the Mayor's Office for Economic Opportunity. So thank you, Mark. Thanks, Mark. Thanks everyone at Beta Bagels for having us here, um, and also to Gail Brewer. Um, it's, I just wanted to just, I'm, I'm only here to do a quick introduction. Tim is gonna take over and really talk you through what the Civic Service Design Studio is, who we are, how we do it, what is service design to us. Um, for Actually, before I start, um, or before I move, get off this, this up here, I just wanted to get a little hands up of like who knows what service design is or has, or pr who practices it. How about that? A little bit who wants to practice it more. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to get a little taste of that. I think for us, we're really trying to understand how service design can be most effective across government. May, many folks have maybe heard that service design is something that really helps deploy product or technology and you know quick research sprints to get something out, out there and um, to scale and test. But there's also what kind of 
Matt was really hearkening to of like how we really try to look at service design kind of further sort of, you know, you know, upstream of like where in it are we really trying to make sure that we're really deeply connected to residents and how are we doing that? But not just like us going out as like these consultants into the world and saying, let's talk to residents and ask them what they think about a service or what they need, but let's really train up our own government agency agency colleagues to be able to practice and understand it so they can do it themselves and go and walk out the door and get out of their cubicles and be able to connect to the folks that they're trying to support um, and make changes with. Um, for today, you know, let me, maybe we should move some slides, but just a really bit of background to kind of further off what Matt was saying. So the service design studio is a quite small pod within a larger group of 70 folks in the Mayor's Office for Economic Opportunity. Tim and I make up about half of the core team, so there's a total of about four of us, uh, enhanced by about two to, two to three apprentices and fellows throughout the year. Um, and so we sit in, in a team of you know, evaluation, digital product, tech, data integration, um, and research. Um, and um, one big important one is we lead on the poverty measure work as well. So we sit in this type of office and you know, two things to say. One is that we couldn't be doing the work that we're doing without this team. We can't sit, service design like anything can't sit in a silo. And so we really try to, you know, bring the evidence coming from our program and evaluation team and the expertise of our product and tech um, and data folks to really help us understand how best uh, we can um, apply service design processes across the city. Um, we know we have a big job to do. New York City is comprised of 8.6 million people. Um, when added together, uh, about half or so are in poverty or near poverty. Um, so we have a huge, you know, we're never sort of loss of projects to work on. So we work deeply in this space. Um, and so I'm gonna kind of let Tim really take over and talk you through more in context about what we do. Um, I think, you know, and then I just want to say, because we don't have, come, come on, um, we don't have a lot of time here. I know we have just a half an hour, but please put those questions on <coughs> the bit.ly link or just write them down because something we want to make sure we do, because we have a ton to talk about. We could be here all day talking about the work that we're doing, but we want to make sure that questions that aren't answered today can be, uh, that we can respond to you afterwards as well. So thanks so much. <laughs> I just want to say thank you to the for President's office and Microsoft for the delicious basic coffees. <laughs> uh, probably the be best government breakfast I've had. <laughs> um, so our office, we like to ask this question, how might we use evidence and innovation to reduce poverty and increase equity? And we are kind of one of those innovations in a sense. Um, bringing service design into government is, is, we like to think of as kind of innovated in and of itself. Um, but what do we mean when we talk about design? It was really cool to see probably 50% of the hands go up uh, as service design practitioners or familiar folks. So we like to use uh, the analogy of a theater when we talk about the service design of a program. Um, so with a theater production, you have the audience, you have who is kind of receiving the production, you have the actors and actresses and the orchestra who are delivering the production to the audience. And then behind the scenes, you've got the uh, set designers and the carpenters and the person who's in charge of raising and lowering the curtain and the people wearing all black who in between sets change the scenes uh, and the script writers and the director and the producer um, and the guy who opens the door for people to come in in the morning and locks it at night. Um, we, service design is about understanding the kind of holistic picture of programs and products and experiences. So the theater is kind of an apt analogy for us in this way. Um, when applied to kind of programs and services in government, uh, our front stage, right? Um, the people and places and things that your user audience are directly interacting with, right? So it might be frontline staff, case planners, case workers, digital products, um, we have our Access NYC, Growing Up NYC, these are things that directly touch city residents or people that are using the things that we're working on. 
forms, paperwork, physical spaces, right? These are all things that happen on the front stage, excuse me, that people directly interact with. All those things are enabled by what goes on behind the curtain, right? Um, the people, the technologies, the policies, the systems that support that service delivery. So training procedures, IT infrastructure, data integration, um, program management, right? All the things, we call them the invisible forces, that you as a consumer of a service, as a, someone who is receiving or delivering a service, may not be seeing every day or coming to contact with, but those are the things that actually enable and govern the thing that you are experiencing, right? Um, and in government, quite often, we are working on programs and things that may not directly impact residents, but may actually impact the people who are impacting residents, right? So we run these workshops, which I'll talk about in a little bit, and one of our workshop participants from DCAS, also in this building, um, had a really interesting thing to say. She was like, well, our front stage is really everyone else's backstage. We were trying to figure out what she would work on in our workshop. And I think that's a really kind of insightful thing um, to come out of government, right? And that's okay. Oftentimes, the work on the backstage products and services is just as important as the work on the front stage products and services, right? Might not be as shiny or sexy things, like we're not building these new apps and things necessarily, but we are enabling the people that enable the people, right? Uh, and that is really important and crucial work. That's a lot of what we do in government. So at its core, Civic service design, and Matt and Mari both alluded to this, is the practice of understanding the real lived experiences of the people who use and deliver programs, so the front stage folks, uh, to inform our decisions about the policies, processes, and systems that enable and govern those experiences, all the things that are happening on the backstage. So we need to understand that whole picture. Um, another one of our uh, colleagues in operations is kind of been one of our service design champions, uh, said it even better than us, I think, that service design is about combining the expertise of people who build a product or service with the expertise of the people who use that product or service. So we like to be really intentional about bringing those people into the fold, and I'll talk about how we do that in a little bit. Um, and then as Matt said, kind of, why do we do this? So that we can start to make a shift from this traditional model of program development and design, a bunch of people get in a room, out comes an RFP, maybe, maybe it's good, maybe it's not, we don't really know, um, to a more kind of iterative approach with people and their needs at the center. Um, and again, kind of the last 101, design is really a mindset, a skill set, a set of processes, that help us consistently put and remind us about people's needs to make sure they're always at the center of all the work that we're doing. Um, so, that being said, how are we bringing design to the city of New York, into city government? Uh, Matt and Mari both alluded to, we are a small but mighty team with a quite a large user base, um, eight and a half million residents, over 300,000 public servants, and 125 plus uh, agencies and offices. And here we are, a mighty team of four to eight designers. Um, our backs are strong. Uh, so we uh, very intentionally kind of split our work up into these two tracks, building capacity and doing the work. So we uh, execute service design projects. We partner with agencies and offices um, on six to 12 month engagements to deliver service design work. Uh, we also have a service, uh, service design capacity building programming. That's kind of the, another half, 40% of the work that we do. Um, that includes office hours, trainings and workshops. Let me actually go into that. Um, our tools and tactics um, and a civic design forum that we co-organize with Do It and NYC Planning Labs. Um, I'll talk a little bit about each of these in a little bit more detail. So our tools and tactics are kind of uh, service design content, uh, a field guide, especially designed for public servants. So this was maybe one of our first design products, actually. Um, the tools and tactics 
came out of a service design effort talking to people working in government, other designers working in government, designers working in the private sector to better understand how to communicate and what was kind of the most useful and resonant pieces of design and how do we get that into the hands of people working in government in a way that kind of strips out all of the design lingo and makes it feel very accessible, very usable, very actionable for people actually doing that government work uh, day to day. Um, it's available in a binder, which we're slowly running out of, uh, mm -hmm. field guides, and it's all available online at civicservicedesign.com if you want to check it out in more depth. We are currently working on what you see here is version 2.0. We are working on version 3.0, which we hope to release this October. We're really excited about that. So always iterating like good designers do. Um, so we had our tools and tactics. We were putting it out in the world, and we found that wasn't quite enough for people. People were, it made them hungry, right? It kind of was an amuse-bouche for the service design meal. Um, so we started to build out some more offerings. Um, we have tools and tactics in action trainings. So these are workshops that we offer every six weeks. Uh, we're, they're about half day long. Uh, people come in, we do some kind of quick service design 101, practice the basics, and then the second half of the day people spend working on their own projects that they come in with, um, using some of our service design tools and having us in the room kind of helping them work through uh, some of that stuff. Uh, CivicServiceDesign.com, there's an Eventbrite link if you are interested. Uh, we encourage you to sign up, they're every six weeks. Uh, we also host Civic Design Forums, I mentioned. Um, so this is our way of kind of building and supporting and gathering a community of practice around design very similar to what we're doing here at Beta Bagels. Um, they happen every two months. Um, the space shifts every now and then. Um, we talk about technology, design. It's a place for people like just like this to gather, meet each other, learn about new things that are happening in and around the city in those spaces. Um, we also have an office hours program. So for about two years since we officially launched, we've been opening our office doors for public servants to come in uh, four hours a week to talk to us about the stuff they're working on. Maybe they're just design curious. They're not sure what this service design thing is all about. Maybe they are uh, design practitioners and they're looking for kind of some support or some therapy. Um, <laughs> uh, but these have been really great. We've done, uh, actually before I move on, Noel has been to an office hour. And so is Emily. And so is Emily. Oh yes, you guys are both in this picture. <laughs> uh, a little Where's Waldo action. Mm -hmm. um, these have been really great. We've done 185 office hours. We've touched about 30% of city agencies. We've met with 323 employees. We've also spoken with folks from 26 other government agencies, meaning from other municipalities, other cities, other countries, other continents. It's been a really great experience for us to learn about all the great work that's going on in the city and to kind of start to um, the front door for our capacity building as well. Um, so that's our kind of building capacity stuff. I also mentioned we do the work as well, right? And we call our partnerships with city agencies and offices designing for opportunity projects. Um, so again, these are six to 12 month engagements where we work very closely and collaboratively with uh, partner teams from city agencies and offices on problems that address issues of uh, poverty and equity in the city. Um, some of the projects we've worked on to date and some are still working on. Um, shelter enhancements, so looking at um, improving shelter practices to uh, mitigate the trauma that people face in homelessness. Uh, so we work closely with DHS on that. Um, currently working on a project with the Mayor's Office for Criminal Justice and the First Lady's Office around better supporting women re-entering uh, from Rosie's jail after they've been incarcerated. Um, and we just concluded a, a almost year-long project with a team from ACS, the Administration for Child Services, um, focused on how to bring more family voice and choice into their referral process for their prevention services programs. And I'm not gonna go into much depth content-wise on this because we have a lot more to talk about and we don't have that much time, but I am gonna talk about kind of what does a project look like for us and give a little bit of process behind it. Um, please ask questions if you're interested in specific content and we'll do our best to answer all of them later on. 
Uh, we also have case studies and field logs and things up on our website if you're interested in learning more, civicservicedesign.com, another shameless plug. Um, so what does the project really look like for us? Uh, we use our tools and tactics methodology to move through a project with our partners. So set the stage, talking to people and connecting the dots, research and synthesis, uh, moving into trying things out, building concepts and prototypes, um, taking them out into the real world and testing them to make sure that they're the things that people actually want and that they're feasible, and then focusing on impact. What does implementation look like? What is um, what are the metrics that we'll be measuring our implementation with, et cetera, et cetera. So that's kind of a very high level of what our projects look like. Um, this was our ACS project timeline. Again, better part of, if not actually longer than a year. Um, so a little bit more in depth about each of those things. Uh, we really start projects by first understanding the landscape and then going out and talking to people in agencies and at service providers to help us better understand kind of that institutional perspective. Because Mari mentioned, we don't wanna be the consultants coming in, but the reality is that we kind of, we don't work in these agencies, so we do need to get up to speed a little bit. Um, so we go out and we talk to people in the agency, at providers, frontline staff, to understand what their experience is like. Um, we kind of start to build our service blueprint. This is also a really valuable part of the process for us and for our partners because we're talking to people at agencies, at providers, across divisions, starting to poke holes in those silos, right? We all know government can be very frustrating because you work here or you work here or you work here, but people don't often talk to each other in this way. So our projects are very intentional about bringing people across divisions, across teams, across agencies, to the table from the beginning. Um, with that kind of institutional knowledge built up, we go out and we start to engage the people that will be receiving the service. Uh, for the ACS project, we talked with 42 families and a few teenagers um, and parent advocates as well. Um, for ACS, this was a really powerful part of the project. I think for all of our, our partners, this is really powerful. We were working with a team at ACS that had been wanting to do work like this since they started, um, but were not able to kind of operationalize it. We helped them work through some of the legal and political hurdles. Um, having kind of our cachet of the mayor's office, I think, helped with that. We also helped them figure out what it's like to kind of build a sustainable culture and practice of meaningful and trauma-informed family engagement, right? So we're talking to folks who are impacted by child welfare um, about traumatic moments, so we need to be able to do this in trauma-informed ways. So we help them build that practice that they're continuing to do after we've kind of concluded the project. From all of that research, um, we start to get a better sense of who's involved in the experience, what the key moments are, um, and then we start to bring people back together. So agency staff, provider staff, parent advocates, families in the case of ACS, to co-design sessions, workshops and rooms like this where we're presenting back research and having those people sit together, deputy commissioners with case planners and uh, other support staff at a table coming up with service enhancements together, which is a really powerful experience and really valuable for us to get not just the kind of typical people in the room coming up with ideas, right? So we're bringing all those people back together, another opportunity to create that, that voice and, and uh, for the vulnerable populations that we're trying to serve. Um, we take those ideas and we start to build them out in really lightweight ways. Um, we make kind of little card games to test out ideas and we take them out into the field and we work with the, the residents and the staff and people at agencies to say, is this resonating with you? Um, will this pr uh, improve your experience? Uh, when we talk to agency staff, is this feasible? Will this make your life easier, right? So we're trying to get, again, that whole picture, front stage and backstage. Um, magic wand, very important. Oftentimes when we are working with agency staff and we're presenting new ideas, we have to do, we have to be really intentional about getting them to turn off their typical constraint brain and be open to new solutions. So this is something that I started bringing to uh, certain workshops with certain people uh, that I could wave and the constraints would magically disappear. Um, 
So from those early prototypes, we build up into um, uh, more fleshed out prototypes. Uh, we build content that can turn into paper materials and brochures that make services more understandable and easy to sell to families and get them excited about it. Um, new systems to support agency staff and providers working with families in family-friendly ways, um, supports that they didn't necessarily maybe have before. That's just kind of an example of some of the things that we might, might come out of these projects. Um, so that's kind of our process, sort of end-to-end. -end. There's a lot of gaps in there. Did this very quickly. Um, please ask questions later. Finally, how do we know if all this stuff is working? Um, we do a lot of engagement. How do we know if it's working? So because we kind of have these two tracks of building capacity and doing the work, we have two ways of looking at in, um, if, we, if this stuff is working. So for the capacity building work, we look at process, right? Are our partners, are, are the people that we're working with in office hours and workshops changing their practice based on working with us, based on their, their, their touch points with us? For the, the project-based stuff, we're looking at outcomes-focused project goals. What are the tangible, measurable outcomes that we can drive towards with the things that we are making, with the changes that we're recommending to services? Um, some examples of the capacity building um, outcomes might be facilitating meaningful cross-stakeholder engagement, um, including resident and frontline staff voices in program design and development, uh, taking an iterative-based approach towards implementation, um, we've actually seen an awesome outcome from our ACS work. Our partners are taking our process and now applying it to their other projects. So um, using kind of iterative product development uh, frameworks for things that they're doing. They stood up a survey that went out to 20,000 prevention parents in just under two months working in week-long sprints, testing with providers and families and iterating as they went something that they had not done before working with us, so we're very honored and proud to see that happen. Uh, and then on the kind of doing the work, the outcomes, uh, how are new service enhancements impacting the experience, right? So in the example of ACS again, are we seeing increased direct family inputs in service referrals, right? We're talking about voice and choice. Are we seeing less referrals come back because they're missing pertinent information? Are we improving the quality of referrals? Are we seeing an increase in the percentage of referrals that are actually leading to sign up or completion? These are examples of some kind of outcomes-based metrics that we might uh, apply to, to projects. Um, lastly, I just wanna close, thank you. Um, I wanna close and say that um, talking to residents, bringing residents in, bringing frontline staff into program design and development is uh, kind of foundational to what we do. It is not the end all be all of what happens in government. It takes more than design to stand up new and successful and innovative government programs. It takes technology, it takes data, it takes program management, it takes people, it takes time, and it takes money. However, move past this too quickly. However, bringing those people in in meaningful ways, going out and talking to people, we believe is foundational to all those other pieces and a, a kind of new and innovative approach to government services that we hope kind of sticks around and we are doing our best to make sure spreads throughout the way that this city works. And I'll leave you all with this quote from a provider that we worked with um, in ACS who said, uh, we did some work with their families, our families do not hear enough that they are agents of change and your conversations with them were a place where such energy starts. So we hope that kind of going out and talking to people while not everything, it becomes kind of a foundational way of working for the city. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I have uh, just a few questions from the internets and then we can go from there. Uh, the first one is how do you pick which projects you work on? Um, and then the other one was, da, 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 da. shit, what was the other one? Um, what, uh, what are some of the challenges encountered when trying to poke holes through government silos? Excellent questions. Uh, okay, one at a time. So how do we pick projects? Uh, a number of ways. Um, 
Our ACS project was the result of an open call for proposals that we put out in late 2017, I believe, um, to all city agencies and offices. We got back 15 responses from nine different agencies, and we went through a pretty rigorous process to evaluate them. Um, we brought in four semifinalists for half-day workshops to figure out kind of what was the challenge that we wanted to work on and what was the team that we wanted to work with. Um, out of that came this ACS Pathways to Prevention project. Um, we will be putting out another open call, I think, um, at the end of this year. So if you work in a government agency or office and are excited about working this way, keep your heads up for that. Um, we also get projects from our other teams at NYC Opportunities. So the project on women re-entering from Rosie's came out of uh, conversations that our program and evaluation team was having with um, the Mayor's Office for Criminal Justice and the First Lady's Office, and they were like, this would be a cool service design project. It was a good match, um, so we took it on. And then uh, we also have kind of some stop everything moments uh, from City Hall where there are important things coming down the pipe and we need to work on them. And the shelter enhancements project is one of those. Um, Homestat, another uh, homelessness, uh, street homeless project that we did about three or four years ago now um, was another one of those things. So um, various, the answer is various ways um, all have resulted in kind of good projects for us. Second question was, uh, oh, poking holes in science. Yes. Um, honestly, I think the question was, what are, what are the difficulties? What are the challenges? Uh, what, what were the, oh, hold on a second here. Sorry. Um, what are some of the challenges encountered when trying to poke holes through government silos? Yeah, um, I think government is big and bureaucratic by design. Um, so folks are not necessarily used to working across divisions, across teams, um, not necessarily incentivized to do so. However, there are certainly, like we found champions in um, agencies and offices and divisions that are excited about collaborating and are excited about looking at experiences holistically. Um, the challenge is just that government is not necessarily designed to work in that way. So we are kind of, I said this to somebody the other day, it's like walking in like waist deep water sometimes. You just have to put more effort and energy to take steps forward. Uh, all right. We I have one back there. Great. Can you repeat the question yeah, just so that way yeah. the camera gets it? Good morning. The question was, what is the kind of uh, effect of the work that we've done on homelessness? Um, I, didn't th I didn't think about this, because <laughs> I want to be. For, so I want to back up one. The service design studio is quite young. We, we kicked off in late 2017. Um, we really, where we have been finding ourselves most effective is not, is actually, having those interactions with, for example, the Department of Homeless Services. So for example, the project that Tim brought up around really understanding where trauma, where, where a family or an individual moving through shelter is experiencing high levels of trauma from the minute they come through the door or the minute they're interacting with a case planner. For us, it's not necessarily, for that project in particular, it wasn't about what intervention physical or pro product type interventions need to happen in those moments. It was getting DHS to also realize that trauma, being trauma informed or and trained in um, servicing families and children and individuals to and being more trauma sensitive was not something where just mental health service providers could come in and do that type of triage. It was that DHS came to a realization that trauma informed training needed to happen across the entire agency. 
This is something that was just realized sort of, or through this project um, emerged um, just very recently in the last few months. So their commitment is to actually look into training the entire agency in a more trauma sensitive way so that every staff member and every provider is um, more equipped for that. Now, it, that's, so that's something that's supposed to happen next year. And we, what we really try to do also is make sure that when we're working with residents, it's not just thanks for coming to a focus group, thanks for your research, and then never hear from us again. It's us saying we need to continue to be more transparent about what we've done, that the interactions that we've had with you, and how we follow up with them. So that's something where we have to work very deeply with agencies, find those champions to make sure that whatever work that you're doing, you have to translate that back on a regular basis to the providers and to the folks that are working with those providers or everyone's gonna stop believing that you're ever trying to do anything. And we totally realize that. So that's something that's pretty big, a behemoth behavior change too. So that's something what, that we're tackling right now. I, I, I understand. <laughs> I have questions from the internet. Um, so okay, we'll, we'll go back and forth. Um, so um, how is this affecting public-private partnerships, and what percentage of new services were launched under this administration? So maybe percentage or maybe numbers. We're using the civic service design principles. Can you qualify that? And then how is this affecting public-private partnerships? Yeah, we're... we're to go back to the, er we're still early, so we actually are, this is, this is uh, even though we're new, we're, we have put ourselves under an evaluation to measure these things, which are coming out later this year, as well as bringing on a lot of folks who are, service design is a really new I, like concept or pro like way of thinking inside of government. It's been around for a long time in the design world, like the private sector design world, but to work in a civic space is quite new. So to be, really be able to measure our impact is something that, you know, especially when you're working in the sort of area we are of like really trying to understand deeply how to change like both the behavior and approach of the way government is delivering services. So to see that change is gonna take um, quite a few years of an arc. So, you know, uh, but um, what was the second part of your question? The how question? is it affecting public-private partnerships? Yes, yeah, so this is the other thing is, public-private partnerships from, and the, you know, they're always looking for like, what's your, what are you gonna make? What's your solution? And then we'll give you some money, right? And it's like, design is such an iterative pro process. When we work with agencies too, they're like, what new technology or what app are you gonna develop for us by the end of your six to 12 months? And you're like, that might not be the answer. It could be a form change. It could be that you have to reconstruct the way you write your RFPs. You know, that there could be a, it could be a whole different thing around how you have conversations with your providers, or maybe it's about training, training different folks to think differently or provide services differently. Those are some ways that could be a solution, but we never want to promise up front, right at the beginning, that that's what you're going to get. And so, when you're trying to talk it to you know funders who who really want to have, who want to support us, we have to really do this like buy-in pitch of like working with us in an ambiguous space and working iteratively with us to trust that we will find ways to cre you know create change in in the timeline that we can give them. Um, and so investing in process is a whole new arena that we're working on, but it's a lot about building up this portfolio of what's been done 
that our team's done, but not just our team, it's what has a design um, space done in general um, and what successes are in that using the methodologies that are tried and true um, and then show it and using that as a way to really amplify what we can do in government and ask folks to, to invest in us and give us that um, opportunity, just like they've given us the opportunity to put new technology into government. So what's been your biggest measured improvement so far from the building or changing and service design? What, what sort of was your biggest success story? Right. I would say, I would say CS was actually yeah. huge. Big surprise for us is, I think before we started the um, project with the Administration for Children's Services, we thought, oh, you know, wouldn't it be a really great dream if one day an agency actually said to themselves, we'd like to invest in having service designers on our team as well, not just calling on the service design studio and asking for, you know, some type of, you know, interim support. And um, just within less than 12 months, now they're actually going to be um, hiring service designers to, because of the influence that we've had on them, they're moving forward with hiring service designers to come onto their team to um, support another project that they're doing. And that, and that to us is quite surprising <coughs> for us, um, but also inspiring um, you know, for them to actually uh, want to go out and build like more trauma sensitive ways to actually have conversations with families and children directly. So that's something that they're interested in pursuing as well. So those are some concrete things. Yeah, can I ask just a follow up to that? What's the best sort of um, success story as far as implementation of good service design? Just kind of, can you repeat the question? Yeah, uh, good success story of implementation of service design. Um, I'm actually going to ask Nathan, do you mind talking a little bit about Street Smart? Uh, sure. So, Nathan, you have to go up here though. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Nathan Sorry. is kind of one of our uh, beta clients almost. <laughs> Hi. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize I was going to be quite honest. Yeah, me neither. Um, yeah, I'm glad you're here. <laughs> so I, I just want to uh, first really honor that question about um, the really real um, experience of, for a lot of people, homeless, the situation of homelessness not getting better. So I don't want to um, seem like when we're talking about the processes of trying to, to, to improve the process, um, that it, it hasn't really solved the issue for so many people, and that is a crisis, that is a tragedy, and we all need to um, lift that up, and picture the homeless is very important for the work that they're doing that. So, so um, with that said, um, I, I think that when Homestat was launched, um, the de Blasio administration uh, was um, uh, trying to respond to street homelessness in a different way. And so one of the things that they did in the Homestead Initiative was uh, to work with the uh, Civic Design Studio, which was just getting started, like I mentioned, to do this um, stakeholder engagement process. So met with, they, they met with um, case managers from all the five different contracted outreach providers that are the, the frontline staff for, for street homeless outreach work. And one of the things we, we learned through this process was that the data system that they were using um, was, was they were not able to capture the information that they needed to, to service their clients. So from that stakeholder engagement process, realized that we needed to design a new case management system that all of the outreach providers could use. So developing that, um, from that idea, we, the IT at DHS built a new case management system and we used the civic service design, uh, like user-centered design principles um, uh, with uh, somebody from Mayor's Office of Opportunity uh, serving as a product manager to meet with the, the providers dozens of times to, to see how the, 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 the providers are using um, their case management system to go on ride-alongs to see, like, how, you know, I, I went on a ride-along with an outreach team and saw, like, what the work is when they're trying to interact with, with people directly. And that's something that DHS had never done before when it was designing its systems. So that... Um, resulted in a very different type of uh, data system um, that the providers have reported to us um, helps do their work more efficiently. Um, so it, it, that, that's a small kind of like consolation to somebody who's still experiencing homelessness and doesn't have a permanent housing, housing placement for them. But anything we can do um, to improve the efficiency of the people that are serving the most vulnerable New Yorkers is, is really important. And I think that the the process um, and kind of the example set by Civic Service Design Studio was 
important part of changing the way DHS is doing work mm -hmm. in this area. So. Thanks. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think another an important part of that. Oh, yeah, round of applause for Nathan. Yeah. An important thing to note is like there was a lot of political will behind that work, um, a very willing and uh, capable partner in DHS, um, kind of willing to build a new system and work with us in that way and at speed. Um, and I think, you know, we as the mayor's office of economic opportunity aren't running these programs necessarily. It takes a partner willing to invest time, money, and energy into implementation and making change happen. So um, part of our work is like figuring out who the right people to work with are to make that change happen. So, so yeah. we, we, are, we have one last question. Okay. Uh, I'm glad that you talked about employment and working with, and I'm gonna throw this over to our great organizer, Kate uh, Nicholson, who has the last and final question. Oh, okay, um, my last and final question. Um, I was wondering, what would you say the difference is between uh, designing services in government versus designing services um, in the private sector? Um, and I had a sort of follow-up question about how you define the problems with the people you work um, and how they come to you with the problems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think um, it's a good, what I said was a good segue. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think in the private sector, um, there is a lot, often, a lot more, uh, it is a lot easier to move more quickly. Um, there is less, often, can be, less bureaucracy, less silos, um, less uh, rules, almost, to cut through. Um, we have rules in government around procurement and around what can and can't happen, and they are there for good reason, but it makes making change difficult. Um, we are risk averse by nature, I think. Um, and I think that's the big difference is in the private sector, you might find companies more willing to take risks uh, to make change and implement new services. Um, we are not quite there. Um, that would be, I think, my, my answer. Do you wanna follow yeah. up? Yeah, I mean, I came to government from, uh, like my, my whole career arc in design has been about working from in, in nonprofit first in community development and and really trying to understand what it was like to be on the ground and working with the communities that I grew up in. Um, and then coming into government and then being a designer and then being told you can do everything very quickly and beautifully and blah, 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 blah. And then coming into here and saying to myself, wow, this is a place where you need a massive amount of patience to make what you want to make to make a solution that you hope that you're trained in school to turn out within less than a year, you know, and make a thesis that's like, I solved the, I changed the world with my thesis or something, right? Here is a very different attitude. Here you don't get paid the way you would in private sector, you know. Here you have to really believe that come, that, that you're, you're going to use design and the process of design and simplifying and decomplicating this kind of behemoth of a, of a space um, and untangling what we call like untangling Christmas lights. And that's part, that's a huge part of our design process right now. And I hope that like in five years or whatever, that's not what we're doing, that, that those things are straightened out and that we can just talk shop about how to get things done and just like fix bulbs along the way. But right now we're in this time where we're really trying to just understand how to untangle everything identify the champions that are willing to work with us and to teach us as designers, because we're not the experts. We just know how to listen and we know how to organize and we know at the end of the day not to let go of like, you need to talk to your residents. You can't stop forgetting to talk to the people out there that are gonna use your services or the things that you're gonna make are gonna die on the vine. So that's kind of where, you know, I feel like we are right now. Um, and, you know, that's kind of my passionate response to, to your question. Yeah. Um, with that, uh, let's give them a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Internet. <laughs>